Coming up on this Monday edition of Newsline at noon, authorities investigating the missing Malaysia Airlines jetliner are searching for possible debris spotted by the Vietnamese Navy as they race to find clues about the fate of the plane. Tens of thousands of doctors go on a one-day strike in protest at the government's medical reform proposal. It's the first such walkout in 14 years. Plus, a North Korean flag tanker is at the heart of a tense standoff over the unauthorized sale of oil by Libyan rebels. The government is threatening to bomb the tanker if it leaves the rebel-held port. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Odin Ju in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, the Malaysian Airlines plane, which disappeared over the South China Sea, could have disintegrated in midair, say investigators. Debris that could belong to the plane has been spotted and dozens of planes and boats have been scouring the area since dawn. Yes, Interpol is also investigating more suspect passports used by passengers who boarded the missing flight. Our Kim and Ben has the details. A Vietnamese plane has spotted possible debris, a door and a section of the tail, from the missing Malaysia Airlines jet that vanished on Saturday with 239 people on board. People of boats and planes are tempting confirmed to find now the sun is up. This comes as officials investigating the disappearance are said to be narrowing the focus of their inquiries on the possibility that the plane disintegrated mid-flight. A source close to preliminary investigation told Reuters that the fact there doesn't appear to be much debris could indicate the aircraft broke up at around 35,000 feet. Asked about the possibility of an explosion, such as a bomb, the source said there was no evidence yet of foul play. Terrorism is not being ruled out especially as Interpol has confirmed at least two passengers on board have been traveling on fake passports. On the possibility of hijack, uh, we are not ruling any possibility. However, it's important to state that uh, our main concern is to focus our effort in finding the missing aircraft. Interpol says a check of all documents used to board the plane had revealed more suspect passports that were being further investigated. Just an hour into the flight, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared and is presumed to have crashed off the coast of Vietnam. Despite being in the very early stages of the investigation, the Malaysian jet's disappearance appears to be among rarest of aviation disasters, as whatever happened did so when the jetliner was cruising. Takeoff and, in particular, final approach and landing are the most dangerous parts of a flight and appears when most accidents occur. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. Tens of thousands of doctors across the nation here in Korea are on a one-day strike this Monday in protest at government reform plans for the medical sector. The government says the walkout is unacceptable and illegal. Kwon Shua reports. A one-day strike led by the Korean Medical Association began earlier this Monday morning. Doctors won't be providing medical services and many hospitals across the nation will be closed. Emergency rooms will remain open. Starting Tuesday and running through March 23rd, the strike will transition to a work-to-rule action, meaning doctors won't work more than 40 hours a week and will treat patients for no longer than 15 minutes. A full six-day strike is then planned to begin on the 24th. Monday's walkout will be larger than initially expected as the Korea Intern Resident Association announced its participation on Saturday. That decision was spurred after the government said it would press criminal charges against striking doctors and suspend their business operations. The walkout coming in the middle of the negotiation process between the government and the medical association is unacceptable. It's clearly an illegal action that puts public health at risk. 
It's regrettable that we had to make the extreme decision of closing hospitals and not treating patients. I'm resentful toward the government. The KMA strike was called in protest of a government plan to introduce a telemedicine system that would allow for patients in remote areas to be diagnosed via webcam, smartphone, or even email. KMA doctors say it will impair the quality of medical services. The Medical Association is also up in arms over a government move to run for-profit subsidiaries. While the government says it will improve the nation's medical industry, the KMA says it will only lead to a hike in medical bills. Doctors are concerned the reforms could eventually lead to privatization of the medical sector. In order to minimize inconveniences on Monday, usually the busiest day for hospitals, the government has ordered public health centers to extend their hours. The medical strike stands to be the largest in 14 years, and with negotiations between both sides at a stalemate, some fear it will continue for the long term. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Now, in response to the nationwide doctor strike, the government has vowed to take legal measures as far as business suspension against those taking part. President Bakune has expressed regret about Monday's walkout and ordered her top aides to hold those involved accountable. Speaking at a meeting of her senior secretaries this morning, the president emphasized the one-day strike was unjustified, putting public health at risk to serve the interests of the doctors' association. She added the group action will hamper national development and hurt the economy. Leaving the door open for a reasonable and constructive dialogue with the association, President Beck reaffirmed her intention to reform the medical sector. Libyan government and rebel forces continue to trade threats over the loading of crude from a North Korean flagged tanker amid a standoff between the two sides at a port in eastern Libya. Kim Jion reports. Libyan authorities have dispatched a force to a port held by armed protesters to stop a North Korean flag tanker from leaving with crude sold without government permission. Culture Minister Haib Alamin said Sunday that the force consists of qualified naval officers and revolutionaries, or former rebels now being paid by the government, and adds that it has the authorization to strike the tanker with force if it does not comply. Orders were given and all efforts are being undertaken to stop and seize the tanker, if necessary by a strike, if it does not follow orders. The 37,000-ton Morning Glory was docked at the terminal of S. Sider, which is one of the three ports seized by rebels, which is being used to press state authorities for a bigger share of oil revenues. A local daily says the ship has been loaded with 36 million U.S. dollars of crude. Over the weekend, Prime Minister Ali Zidane said the military would bomb the morning glory if it tried to leave the port. The captain of the North Korean flagged oil tanker responded that local militia on board did not allow them to depart. The rebels say any attack on the tanker would be a declaration of war. The incident illustrates the deepening turmoil in the OPEC producer, which has failed to rein in fighters who helped oust Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. Kim Jian, Arirang News. North Koreans flocked to the polls on Sunday as North Korea held its first parliamentary elections under the leadership of Kim Jong-un. Kim is expected to use the poll to promote officials loyal to him and further consolidate his power. Kim Min-ji reports. North Korea on Sunday held nationwide elections for a new rubber stamp parliament, the first under the leadership of Kim Jong-un. The elections, which are held every five years, is expected to shed some light on the power shift taking place in the regime and will likely be used to promote officials depending on their loyalty to the young leader. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency said all voters that are registered went to the polls, with the exception of those who were abroad or at sea. The Supreme People's Assembly fields one candidate for each of the 687 constituencies, with the voters only required to cast yes or no ballots. The results are expected to be announced later Monday. Kim himself was registered as a candidate in the constituency of Mount Baekdu, a mountain on the Korean Peninsula, which Pyongyang describes as a birthplace of Kim and his late father.
The Korean Central News Agency said Kim voted at the Kim Il-sung University of Politics, along with top officials including Che ryong hae director of the General Political Bureau of the Korean People's Army. It also said Kim was accompanied by his younger sister, Kim Yo-jung. It's the first time the younger Kim has been mentioned on the state media, although she has been seen on North Korean television before. Kim Jong-un was accompanied by Choi ryong hae of the Korean People's Army, along with other dedicated workers, including Kim byung ok Hwang byung seo and Kim Yo-jung. Kim Yo-jung was listed along with senior officials of the Central Committee of the Ruling Workers' Party. Hwang byung seo is a vice department director of the Workers' Party, which means that Kim Yo-jung could hold a similar position because her name followed Hwang. North Korea experts say she will likely take on the role of her aunt Kim kyung hee Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. The government has unveiled a set of measures designed to prevent leaks of personal information following a series of security breaches by financial institutions that affected tens of millions of people here in Korea. Our Nayeon Young has the details. From the latter half of this year, financial institutions will only be able to ask for customers' resident registration numbers at the initial application stage. After that, people will not be asked to provide their registration numbers, but instead be asked to verify their identity through other safer means. In light of a series of high-level personal information security breaches, the government made the announcement official on Monday. Financial institutions will also not be allowed to keep collected information for more than five years after the final transaction. Apart from the information that's absolutely necessary, all their data that the financial institution either has or has provided to a third party will be destroyed. The police and the prosecution will jointly and indefinitely crack down on illegal breaches. The government has also tightened the penalty system. If a company is found to have used illegally obtained personal information to make profits, it will be fined 3 percent of the total sales made through using the data. Also, up to a 5 billion won, roughly 4.7 million U.S. dollar fine will be levied on firms that leak customer information. Officials reaffirm that customers should be entitled to set up financial services with just their basic information, such as their registration number and date of birth. People will also be given the option to retract on an agreement to provide personal data and also block telemarketing calls from financial institutions. Na Hyun Kyung, Arirang News. Korea is one of the five Asian nations where the income gap is increasing rapidly. A recent Asian Development Bank report on income equality in 28 Asian nations shows the income gap widened at the fifth fastest pace in Korea between 1990 and 2010. Citing the report, the Bank of Korea said Monday that income inequality worsened most in China, followed by Indonesia, Laos, and Sri Lanka during the period. The bank said globalization and technological developments have led to rapid growth in Asian countries, but many of them have failed to improve their income distribution systems. The Korean government says it will beef up the country's information infrastructure this year to fuel growth and boost competitiveness. Uh, Jim Young Gil reports. Korea's science ministry says it will inject 4.9 trillion won, or some 4.6 billion U.S. dollars, into the country's information technology sector this year in order to fuel economic growth and enhance the country's overall competitiveness. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning says the money will be used to fund numerous projects in central government agencies that were initiated by regional governments. One billion dollars will be used to strengthen IT research, while another billion will be used to upgrade the nation's information and communications technology infrastructure. 
Key projects to receive large amounts of funding include the country's digital infrastructure and initiatives to increase the country's presence in cloud computing, mobile services, and next-generation mobile wireless technology. The Trade Ministry says ICT exports have increased 8.4 percent this year from last to $12.8 billion, fueled by an increase in exports of mobile phones and semiconductors. That gave Korea an ICT trade surplus of $6.6 .6 billion in February, which is a 1.6 percent increase from the same month last year. Global technology research group Gartner says the world's ICT market will grow 3.6 percent this year, fueled by a recovery in the smartphone and semiconductor markets. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Ahead of its latest legal tussle with Apple, Samsung has reportedly decided to withdraw some patent claims from its latest litigation with the U.S. firm. Foss Patents, a German-based blog that specializes in intellectual property rights, says Samsung has filed a stipulation with the U.S. District Court of California to narrow their case by dismissing three claims regarding standard essential patents. The owner of a standard essential patent can use it to prevent others from making, using and selling the patented invention without permission. Samsung had earlier filed for five claims against Apple, including two non-standard essential patents. This news comes as Apple and Samsung are set to return to court on March 31st in order to iron out their ongoing patent dispute. Social networking and mobile communication services are shoring up their resources as mobile messaging sees a surge in popularity. Sun jung in has more. Companies in the social networking and mobile communication sector are enjoying the benefits of a robust and growing mobile messaging market as they gear up for a battle that would determine who will become the top brand for more than a billion smartphone users worldwide. In Korea, search engine Naver is number one thanks to its mobile messaging app Line. Line's annual sales last year stood at 427 million U.S. dollars, a 690 percent increase from a year earlier. The messaging application has grown to more than 370 million subscribers since its creation in 2011. Naver's market value in Korea is $27 billion, the fifth largest in the country, and there is only a small gap between it and fourth place SK Hynix and third place Hyundai Movis. Naver saw its stock value skyrocket after it split from NHN last August. That landed the company in sixth place, allowing it to overtake Kia Motors in December. And just last month, it beat POSCO to take fifth place. In the global mobile messaging market, Facebook is also back on track since topping its sales target in the third quarter of last year. Its recent acquisition of fast-growing messaging startup WhatsApp has also helped it maintain its momentum. Social media giant Twitter is also going strong. Its initial public offering was priced at $26 in November last year, but now its share price has nearly doubled to roughly $54. China's biggest internet company, Tencent, which operates Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, has 600 million registered users and a share price of nearly 80 U.S. dollars. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper is set to arrive in Seoul on Monday for a two-day visit. The presidential office of Chiang Wada says President Park and her Canadian counterpart will look into expanding cooperation in the areas of trade, investment, resources and science and technology when they meet on Tuesday. The security situation on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia is also likely to top their summit agenda. President Park and the Canadian Prime Minister first met on the sidelines of the APEC summit in Bali last October. Turning to some sports news now, soccer fans have an exciting summer ahead with the World Cup finals kicking off in just three months' time. South Korea are playing reasonably well in the run-up to Brazil, notching up a confidence-boosting victory against a strong Greek side last week. Headline News' Sung ji Sun gives us a rundown of what lies ahead for the team. After registering a strong 2-0 victory over Greece in Athens on Thursday, 
confidence is running high as we edge ever closer to the World Cup finals in Brazil, especially as Korea star striker Park Ju Young scored his first A match goal in over two years. Park has had a season to forget, spending most of it on the sidelines for the English Premier League side Arsenal. Despite the rosier spirits, Korea is going to face a tough time in Brazil. Other contenders in Group H also won in their friendly matches with Russia beating Armenia and Algeria beating Slovenia, both to nil. The Korean players will go back to playing for their club teams for the next two months, and by mid-May, head coach Hong Myung-bo will submit a preliminary entry to FIFA with 30 football players' names on it. On May 28th, the Korean squad will invite Tunisia for a final friendly match at home before the World Cup. Following the match, the final roster will be announced and the squad will fly to Florida for training, where the climate and time difference is similar to Brazil. FIFA has received a final roster by June 2nd, and the Korean team must be at their base camp set up at the Iguazu Falls by June 12th, according to FIFA's regulations to be on standby five days before the first group match. And the first match against Russia with Pivotal in making it to second stage by qualifying top or second in the group. Team Korea's Brazil dream is to advance to quarterfinals for the first time at a World Cup on foreign soil. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Good day, I'm Eunice Kim, and here are your headlines from around the world. We begin with the latest on Ukraine, where the struggle over the Crimean Peninsula continues. In a telephone conversation with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Russian President Vladimir Putin defended Crimea's moves to break away from Ukraine to join Russia in a referendum vote scheduled for Sunday. This as thousands staged opposing rallies in Ukraine over the weekend, both in Crimea and in eastern parts of the country. A rally in Sevastopol escalated into street violence as pro-Russian groups attacked a group of Ukrainians. Russian forces seized another border post, tightening their grip on the Black Sea Peninsula. Meanwhile, Ukraine's Prime Minister Artsyn Yatsenyuk announced he will travel to Washington on Wednesday to hold talks with U.S. President Barack Obama. Washington maintains it will not recognize the results of the referendum meant for Crimea to join Russia. And dozens of people have been killed, with more than 100 others wounded following a minibus attack in the southern Iraqi city of Hila. Authorities say a suicide bomber drove through a checkpoint on Sunday in a bus believed to have been packed with explosives. The blast, which took place during morning rush hour, affected surrounding cars in line at the entrance to the Shia-dominated city. Reports of casualties are conflicting. At least 32 are said to have died, with some media outlets reporting as many as 45. The attack comes ahead of elections scheduled for next month. And over to Beijing now, where the Chinese government has expressed its will to get tough on polluters and to strengthen its environmental protection laws. The commitments came in a high-level report released on Sunday. And last Wednesday, at the National People's Congress, China's Premier Li Keqiang declared war on pollution, equipping it as one of Beijing's key priorities. Critics, however, have adopted a wait-and-see approach, as Sunday's report lacked specific enforcement measures. Last Last year, almost all Chinese cities monitored for pollution failed to meet state standards. A team of U.S. researchers say they have found that a blood test can predict the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Scientists at Georgetown University conducted a five-year study during which they examined blood samples from 525 elderly persons and found that testing the levels of 10 fats in the blood could predict the risk of the silent disease over the next three years with a 90 percent accuracy. If the results can be repeated in larger clinical trials, experts say it would serve as a turning point as Alzheimer's is known to quietly attack the brain for more than a decade before its symptoms can be detected.
Good afternoon. Well, it's going to be much milder this afternoon. The winds have died down and temperatures are getting back up to the seasonal norms. But the air will still be dry and the dry weather advisory has been upgraded to a warning in the southeastern part of the country. It's really dry there, so please stay hydrated and be careful of fires. But thankfully, sky will remain quite sunny across the nation all day long. Now, the weather in recent days has been a little like a roller coaster. It was chilly and cold over the weekend and there was snow yesterday morning in the Seoul metro area and it looks like this pattern will continue for at least the next three days. Uh, there's another round of rain in the forecast for Wednesday and temperatures will be up and down this week so please dress accordingly to avoid getting sick. Do keep it in mind and here are the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul will rise to 8 and Gwangju will top out 10 while Daegu Busan should get up to 11 under lots of sunshine. Now for other regions it looks like Jeju and Daejeon will climb up to 9 and Dokdo and Mount Kungang will both see a high of 3 this afternoon. Well, have a great rest of the day and back to you guys in the studio. Well, thank you very much for the turbo weather there, Jian. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Join us again for more updates on the day's headlines on our next newscast at 2 p.m. Korea time. And Jinju and I will be back again at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.